Jim Jordan fancies himself a grinder, a grinder. You must fight. That's what a grinder says. You never give up because life is a game of inches. I've come this far and I'm not backing down. No, I won't back down. Everything I got in life is because I, Jim Jordan, never quit. Jim Jordan tells himself he's indefatigable, but what he really is, is suicidal. He's strapped on a vest of grievances, and this week he's taking everyone out with him. I'm conducting my first live poll. It's in the chat room as we speak. I don't know if I'm going to be able to pull this off, but there's a there's a polling question, and that is, do you think Jim Jordan will ever quit? Or will he go a thousand rounds until Election Day? Will Jim Jordan quit? How many rounds will he go? How much debasement is he asking for? Donald Trump refuses to back down. How does he do it, we marvel? Four criminal lawsuits, countless civil trials, one going on right now where he's already been stripped of his properties and it's doubtful he'll win any of them back in appeal, but he doesn't quit. No, he won't back down. He is in permanent attack mode. You can't, he's a wee, what is it, weebles wobble, but they never fall down. He lost 61 voter fraud cases in the lead up to January 6th, but he kept going. Not a single attorney in the White House would help him steal the election, so he brought in outside counsel. After the electors all met in December to certify for Joe Biden, he got fighting. He just kept moving and making calls. He worked the phones, called the key swing states, urging governors and state legislators to reconvene special sessions to throw out the results and award their electoral votes to me, Donald Trump. And when that didn't work, Donald Trump, because he never backs down, stood on the ellipse before his armed band of imbeciles and ordered them to march on Congress to stop the steal. In fact, that's what they called their rally on January 6th. Stop the steal. And you stop the steal by stopping them from counting the votes. He sat in the White House private dining room that day, watched as his followers violently seized our nation's capital, and they stopped the vote. They stopped the steal temporarily. They injured 140 Capitol Police officers and did millions of dollars in damages. And when people close to Donald Trump tried getting him to call it all off before they hanged Mike Pence, all his chief of staff, Mark Meadows, could say to them was, there's nothing I can do. He honestly believes Mike Pence deserves to be hanged. And after the Capitol was finally cleared out, while January 6th was coming to an end, as Republicans momentarily thought it was time to convene Trump's cabinet and invoke the 25th Amendment, Trump called it a day. He headed out of the West Wing and back to his private residence. And according to the January 6th report, the last thing he said to his staff was, the last recorded words of Donald Trump that day were, Mike Pence really let me down. After all the pain and suffering he caused that day, his last words to the staff was, Mike Pence really let me down. And we marvel at Donald Trump's tenacity. He won't back down. You know, we call it inner strength and, of course, refer to him as unfaltering, dogged and determined. Indeed, we say he's indefatigable. We privately see that as a noble trait. Why can't I be like Donald Trump? But what we're doing is, by saying that, what we're doing is mischaracterizing Donald Trump's inner plumbing. Just like Jim Jordan, Donald Trump is none of those things. He's not indefatigable. He is suicidal. Trump and Jim Jordan can't give up the fight 
because the fight is all they have. They have no choice but to keep going in one direction, even if it's off a cliff. They think they're driven, but their gear shift is stuck in drive. Their lives are one long extended car crash, and they're trying to take us along for the ride. Never surrender. I won't back down. That's what they say. I never quit. I keep going. Rudy Giuliani, just like Donald Trump and Jim Jordan, they think they're Winston Churchill. They refuse to stop. After January 6, after the military had to come in and clear out the Capitol, and it looked like Congress could get back to finally doing the people's business and certify the election for Joe Biden. After all that, as the sun was setting, Rudy Giuliani began working the phones again. At 6 p.m., the night of January 6, with the air still ripe with bear spray, Rudy Giuliani left a message on Senator Tommy Tuberville's phone urging him not to certify the election for Joe Biden. Rudy Giuliani, after the Capitol had been cleared, January 6, insisted he had brand new evidence of fraud. Don't certify. You need to delay the certification so I can present it to Congress because I won't back down. Attorney John Eastman, who spoke with Rudy on the ellipse that day, they spoke together on the ellipse in front of Donald Trump's armed imbeciles. And he insisted that there was incontrovertible evidence that the 2020 presidential election had been stolen. And a few hours later, he saw on his television that his crowd, the same crowd who he and Rudy had instructed to rise, to conduct a trial by combat, as they were putting on their trial by combat, John Eastman saw his minions looking to hang Mike Pence. And John Eastman, according to evidence in his upcoming trial down in Georgia, John Eastman, while the crowd was looking to hang Mike Pence, John Eastman sent an email to Mike Pence's attorney sent an email to the chief counsel to the vice president of the United States, insisting now, now is the time for Pence to move boldly and not certify the election for Joe Biden. Greg Jacob, he's Pence's attorney. He is the, was the chief counsel to the vice president of the United States. He wrote back to John Eastman, and said, thanks to your bullshit, we are now under siege, unquote. Now, a mere mortal receiving an email like that from the chief counsel to the vice president of the United States, a human being would go, hmm, maybe feel a little guilty and maybe back down. But not the indefatigable John Eastman who never gives up. Eastman, dogged and determined, unflinchingly wrote back, quote, the siege is because you and your boss did not do what was necessary to allow this to be aired in a public way so the American people can see for themselves what happened, unquote. He wrote that while people were storming the Capitol looking to hang Mike Pence. He wrote that because John Eastman won't back down. I'm conducting my first live poll right now. If you're in the chat room here on YouTube, uh, the question is, do you think Jordan, Jim Jordan, will ever quit? Or will we go, will he make us, will he debase himself and go thousands and thousands of rounds losing the speakership until Election Day. He is a denier, right? World-class denier. On January 7th, when the whole world realized it was time to put Donald Trump in the funny farm, 
His attorney, Sidney Powell, was meeting in Coffee County, Georgia. According to the Fulton County District Attorney's indictment, she paid, through her nonprofit, a computer analyst $26,000 to break into the voting machines of Coffee County, Georgia, and download Georgia's entire statewide voting machine software so they could pour over the results and prove election fraud. This was on January 7th because Sidney Powell won't back down. On January 8th, the analyst she hired was sending her emails, giving her an update on how quickly he could deliver his report because Sidney Powell She won't back down. You could stand her up at the gates of hell, but she won't back down. It is generally agreed, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, it is generally agreed that his thuggish political rhetoric resulted in the assassination of Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin at a rally celebrating the Oslo Accords which put the Palestinians and Israel on the path towards a two-state solution. If you're ever wondering what happened to the two-state solution, take a good hard look at the current Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu. The Oslo Accords were signed in 1993, and Yitzhak Rabin was killed two years later. Many people hold Benjamin Netanyahu responsible for that. It's called stochastic terrorism. At his funeral, Yitzhak Rabin's funeral, his wife, Leah, walked up to Netanyahu and said, you did this, you killed him. Yitzhak Rabin's wife later recalled how Netanyahu supporters created posters of her husband in a Nazi uniform and threatened him for making peace with the Palestinians. See, Netanyahu opposed making peace with the Palestinians, and he forged alliances with the hard-right militant settlers of the West Bank, who, to this day, not all of them, but some of them, to this day, still celebrate the birthday of Yitzhak Rabin's assassin, and they call themselves patriots. Netanyahu, through his surrogates, called Rabin a traitor, a murderer, a Nazi sympathizer for trying to make peace with the Palestinians. Almost 30 years ago, there was an opportunity for a two-state solution. There was an opportunity for Israel and the Palestinians to live side by side. It would have been fraught with tension and violence, but better than what we have right now. And it was a follower of Benjamin Netanyahu who assassinated the prime minister of Israel, Yitzhak Rabin, who was trying to bring about a two-state solution. Rabin was not killed by a Palestinian. Yitzhak Rabin was killed by a follower of Benjamin Netanyahu. And Benjamin Netanyahu keeps going because he won't back down. You can stand him up at the gates of hell because he will not back down. There are endless corruption trials with his odious family involved. And now, as the leader of Israel, whose calling card was national security, the indefatigable Benjamin Netanyahu can now lay claim to the single worst day in Israel's 75-year history. The single worst day in Israel's 75-year history took place on Benjamin Netanyahu's watch. This is the man who said to Israelis, forget what you were taught, forget what you believe, because I... And only I can keep you safe. He didn't keep his people safe. And while Israel's top leaders, as we speak, 
as his, Israel's top leaders in the military, in their homeland security, Shin Bet, as, as they apologize openly and ask for forgiveness and say, we let you down. Bibi Netanyahu, all he has to say is, I will eliminate Hamas because I won't back down. You know, one would think, Bibi, that after the single worst intelligence failure in Israeli history, you might back down. You might do the honorable thing, Bibi Netanyahu. You might resign. But instead, like Trump, he can't because he's facing criminal indictments. So he moves forward like Jim Jordan, like Rudy, like John Eastman and Sidney Powell, because they won't back down. They don't care how many people they drag into the pits of hell along with them. Nope, they will not back down. I love, love Tom Petty. I wish I were Tom Petty. Tom Petty is the personification of cool without having to let anybody know he's cool. I, growing up, knew that if I were Tom Petty, all I'd have to do was write and play music and everyone would want to be my friend. He wrote anthems like, I won't back down. When they found Tom Petty's body, they discovered a lethal combination of fentanyl, oxycodone, acetylfentanyl and dispropanol fentanyl, those are opiates, I believe, as well as temazepam and alprazolam, which are sedatives, along with citalpram, that's an antidepressant. Uh, he backed down, and I find that very sad because he never hurt anyone. He did nothing but inspire. He backed down because he's a human. He's not a monster. Life is hard, and good, gentle people back down. It's the gentle souls who back down, and we need to protect them from the ones who won't back down. Normal, gentle souls don't stand their ground. They back down. That's the human condition. That's what human beings do. You know, I back down. Uh, the hardest struggle I've ever had was to quit drinking, and I quit before most of you were born. But when I had my kidney stones, I loved the morphine, and I don't know how to pronounce what they gave me. It was delouded. I think that's what they call it. Uh, and when the kidney stones come back, I'll back down. Give me the morphine. Give me the delouded. I will back down because that's what humans do. We back down. Good people take the easy way out. Uh, take the easy way out. Find the shortest distance between two points. It's okay to quit. It's okay to surrender. It's okay to fail, to walk away from a fight, to walk away from a job, a relationship. It's okay to drop out of school. You can quit the team, and you don't have to finish the book. You don't have to eat the entire steak, even though you paid $50 for it. Now, I wanted Bernie. He's a fighter. Did not want Joe Biden. Not a fighter. That was what I said on this show about Joe Biden, who I'm beginning to really think has the potential to go down in history as one of our greatest presidents. It pains me to say this. I was talking to my sister today. We did not like the man. We were Bernie supporters. Biden wasn't going to fight for us. He was too willing to compromise. He's a creature of Washington. He backs down. But you know, one of his greatest accomplishments as president was backing down. After 20 years, he closed shop in Afghanistan. That's it. 
we're going down. Didn't work out, folks. We're going home. We're leaving Afghanistan. First year in office, he brought the troops home. Now, that might not mean anything to you if you're not a baby boomer, okay? But if you're a baby boomer and you remember the 70s, you should be dropping to your knees and thanking Joe Biden one year into office, less than one year into office, he brought the troops home. You cannot overstate the importance of bringing the troops home. Who does that? Who in my lifetime, as president said, we're cutting losses, we're cutting our losses. This war was a mistake, I'm bringing the troops home. Joe Biden was sworn in as president in January. By September, he brought the troops home. Was it messy? Yeah, but not as messy as not bringing the troops home. And yes, I I know he's spending Thanksgiving inside the home of one of the world's worst war profiteers, the odious David Rubenstein, the head of the Carlyle Group. Uh, He maybe isn't pushing for diplomacy in Ukraine. Uh, But Joe Joe Biden, he brought our troops home. And yesterday he spent seven hours in a war zone, not just symbolic, but don't disregard symbolism. He spent seven hours in a war zone and he lectured the people of Israel and he said, don't make the same mistakes we made after 9-11. What a bold and powerful statement for a commander in chief to tell the people of Israel, don't make the same mistakes we made after 9-11. He said, don't let anger and revenge cloud your judgment. Joe Biden is a friend to Israel because right now they are rudderless. They have Netanyahu as their prime minister. And I know most people don't follow Israeli politics, but I can assure you Benjamin Netanyahu is a gangster, a thug, He is incapable of a Nixon goes to China moment. So let me propose this. Let me go on record. I am a Jew, okay? And I am a Zionist. I believe Israel has a right to exist and must exist because we will be exterminated without Israel. I know what I'm like. I know what my family is like, and we need the Jewish people need a country or we will be exterminated. And if you don't care, you end up losing the next cure for cancer. Sorry, that's what I believe. Uh, I also believe the Palestinians deserve a homeland because they, too, have the next cure for cancer. There has to be a two-state solution. And it was complicated. Yasser Arafat fat spoke out of two sides of his mouth. But people with foreign aid and support go from terrorists to statesmen. And we had an opportunity in 93 with the Oslo Accords, Yitzhak Rabin, and the Palestinians were working towards a two-state solution. And it wasn't going to be easy, but it never is. And Benjamin Netanyahu, the current prime minister, one of his supporters, who had been egged on by the Bibi Netanyahu attack machine, assassinated Yitzhak Rabin and... I'm sure Bibi Netanyahu didn't want that to happen, but some of his followers to this day celebrate the birthday of Yitzhak Rabin's assassin. Bibi Netanyahu should resign and go to prison. Now, uh, 
I want a two-state solution. I want peace. And I don't want to argue the particulars of what differentiates a, a terrorist from a militant. I don't, I want peace. I want the Palestinians and the Israelis to live side by side. Gaza is an open air prison. Unacceptable, unacceptable. Now, if you believe in a higher power, as I do, perhaps there are gifts. I'm just throwing this out there, uh, and I'm wrong for saying this, but I'm just throwing this out there. Perhaps not having a functioning United States Congress could be precisely what Israel needs right now. Now, look, again, I'm Jewish. I believe Israel needs to be a Jewish state. Otherwise, it's only a matter of time before we're exterminated. Uh, I know that to the core of my very being. But maybe right now, right now, giving $50 billion, $100 billion worth of weapons might not be the answer. Maybe, you know, uh, you know Biden has sent an aircraft carrier to the Mediterranean. Uh, I think he's sending another one. The region is on high alert. And America is sending a powerful signal that uh, don't mess with Israel. And I hope that tamps down the fear uh, for the people of, of Israel right now and the people in the West Bank and Gaza that we're going to try to stop. This country, which is indispensable in the Middle East, is going to stop the killing. Maybe with a speaker-free Congress unable to pass any supplementals, maybe instead of weapons, we offer diplomacy my apologies to Raytheon. I know you were looking forward to an aid package for Israel. 300 Jewish protesters were arrested inside our capital on Wednesday, demanding that Congress pass a ceasefire resolution. The Washington Post reports that one protester said, we are here to say, not in our name, we are here as Jews, many descendants of survivors of genocide, to stop a genocide from unfolding in real time, unquote. One woman held up a sign that said, my grief is not your weapon. Got it? My grief is not your weapon. Another sign read, never again for anyone. The protests were organized by 25 rabbis with roughly about four to 500 demonstrators inside the Capitol shouting and singing and wearing black shirts that said on the front, not in our name, and on the back, Jews say cease fire now. I know the Middle East is a tough place to understand. But APAC does not speak for American Jews, and it doesn't speak for Israel. It speaks for Benjamin Netanyahu, who is an incompetent right-wing gangster. Like any nation, there are countless disagreements within Israel. But in America, we tend to get only one side, Netanyahu's side. Read Haaretz. Uh, Jews in Israel criticize Israel voluminously. Netanyahu doesn't speak for all of Israel. In fact, he is incredibly unpopular right now. And I've been looking at some polling we're anywhere between 74%. This is, this is, sorry, I just find this uh, 
think of America after 9-11, okay? Right now, <laughs> anywhere, sorry, anywhere between 74% and 94% of Israelis right now hold Benjamin Netanyahu's government responsible for the attack. And they are blaming him for the attack. And a powerful majority thinks Benjamin Netanyahu should resign. That's in Israel. Now compare that to us after 9-11 when George W. Bush, similar thing, ignored intelligence and allowed bin Laden to fly planes into our building. A week later, Bush had the highest approval ratings of any modern American president. So you ask me, why do I think there needs to be a Jewish state? That's why. Because after 9-11, it was considered sacrilege to ask, hey, how come we didn't see the planes coming in before it happened? And don't ask why it happened. And let's just go to war. And I love George W. Bush, even you know, it's and, and you cannot even think to even say, why didn't he protect us? That that's evil. Israel, on the other hand, uh, you have Shin Bet, you have their army begging for forgiveness, admitting they were wrong. Everybody except Bibi Netanyahu and the Israelis want Bibi Netanyahu to resign. That's why I think Israel has to exist. So maybe not having a functioning Congress could be a gift to Israel. Sorry, we can't give your, can't give your weapons right now. The store is closed, but we do have a State Department, and instead of an attack helicopter, can I interest you in an oak bargaining table? Maybe a trip to Camp David? You know, the way we got the Oslo Accords for you? Wars are never won on the battlefield. There are one at the bargaining table. You can talk as tough as you want, BB. I listen. I would love it if you could eliminate Hamas, but you can't. You can't. We didn't eliminate Al-Qaeda. They became ISIS. You must back down. You must back down. Otherwise, you end up looking and smelling like Donald Trump Rudy Giuliani, Bibi Netanyahu, and worst of all, Jim Jordan. You do not want to smell like Jim Jordan. This is the mop-up for October 19th, 2023. Please like this episode, share it, and subscribe. And we're conducting a live poll in our chat room this morning. And the question is... Will Jim Jordan's reign of terror ever end? Are, will he back down? He is debasing himself. He's going before a full house tomorrow with uh, a pair of twos. He's got nothing. Why is he doing this? What is the pathology? America despite what Jim Jordan screamed before his caucus, America doesn't want you, Jim Jordan. America wants you, Jim Jordan, to go away, very far away, and so does Congress. Jordan on Wednesday lost round two in the race for speaker. Nancy Pelosi called his defeat a great day for democracy. Jordan never backs down. He's planning a third vote for today. Probably around noon, he called for a conference of Republicans on Wednesday after he lost. Let's meet and discuss. But they said, no, you're not the guy. There's nothing to discuss. 
I heard that nobody wanted to meet with Jim Jordan after the second vote because they were afraid to go into a room, a caucus room. The, the factionalism now within the Republican Party would make the Middle East look like blah, 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 blah. This is a fractured and broken... I should hire writers, shouldn't I? <laughs> the factionalism inside the Republican Party would make the Middle East look like... And that, you know, if I had a staff, they could give me uh, a, uh, a very synthetic sounding joke. Well, the Republican Party is fractured and broken, and they are not coming back together. They're not. The Democrats, and I, listen, I, I have been highly critical of Hakeem Jeffries, Howie Klein has called him a bag man for Wall Street. That is true. But, you know, uh, from an historical perspective, and by that I mean if you uh, are not living on the streets or in your car. Uh, that's what an historical perspective is, right? The Democrats have been a solid wall of resistance. They will not forgive any of these Republicans for January 6th. And what's also unforgivable is how the Republicans buried the evidence and the memory of January 6th. Jim Jordan is an insurrectionist. He is. That's not me trying to, you know, get attention. That, that is the word. Uh, those are the words of Hakeem Jeffries. That is the narrative coming out of the Democratic Party. Jim Jordan is an insurrectionist. There is no cooperation right now from the Democratic Party because these Republicans seriously are out of their minds. When you look at Jim Jordan, that's who the Republicans are. They wake up every morning feeling lousy. They don't know how to fix it, so they lash out. And if you work with them, then they will, they will destroy you. And that's what the Democrats have realized. Just leave them alone and let them feast on themselves. The feeling in the House among Democrats is after January 6th, there is no working with any of these House Republicans, including and especially Kevin McCarthy. He had Adam Schiff censured this year. And so let them have at it and just stay away. Domestic squabbles most dangerous fight to break up. Which means now Jim Jordan finally knows what it feels like to be denied a peaceful transfer of power. He thought it would go smoothly, the same way Joe Biden thought it was going to go smoothly. Karm is a bitch. It hasn't been a peaceful transfer of power, Jim Jordan. Jordan called a meeting. His henchmen called a meeting. And... He was told nothing to discuss. Look, Jim, you want to go another round? They say you want to waste our time tomorrow with your vanity project. Well, you're not wasting our time Wednesday evening, forcing us to sit in a room as you cajole and make promises and threats you can't keep. They let Jim Jordan know you're a gangster. You're a vicious thug, and we can't trust you. And the fact that you won't quit, that you want to do a third round and debase yourself, proves you're suicidal and taking us out with you. People are really pissed at Jim Jordan right now. But his pathology is he's convinced he's doing the righteous thing. He was taught, don't be a quitter. Nobody likes a quitter. When the truth is, he's just a hateful little vindictive prick. And all he has is his baseball bat. And if he's not clubbing someone over the head 
with it or threatening to club someone over the head with it, he's not alive. This is his comfort zone, and this is why I don't think uh, he'll stop. I think he'll go 100 rounds because this is his comfort zone. Uh, and he deludes himself into thinking he's Kevin McCarthy, that he can go 15 rounds. I can go longer. I'm tougher than Kevin McCarthy. I can go 1,500 rounds and I can win, but he can't. See, McCarthy is just as bad, if not worse, than Jim Jordan on policy. But McCarthy has a modicum of charm. Jordan is just a nasty little man. The final tally on Wednesday's vote was Jordan got 199 votes, while House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries got 212. Jordan got 199. On Tuesday, he got 200. That might not seem like a steep decline, but the dam is about to break. A lot of Republicans in the caucus told him, you get two, maybe a third round, but then I'm gone. And that's where we are this morning. If there is a third round, he may have a moment of self-respect and drop out. But if we go a third round this morning, actually, it's going to be this afternoon, uh, then the dam begins to break. If he puts them through another round of this, you will see massive flooding and he won't back down. He would rather drown in their contempt than resign himself to that's all there is. That's all there is. This is who I am. That's it. I don't get to be speaker. It was, as they say, an ignominious defeat on Wednesday. Jordan lost it by the time they got to the bees. I'm not. I don't know if you saw it. <laughs> he lost it. Oh, I was so happy. I was too messant. He lost it by the time they got to the bees. Once Don Bacon, Ken Buck, and Vern Buchanan voted against him, that was it. The GOP conference didn't even want to talk to him. There's no path forward. They felt nothing but disgust for Jim Jordan. Disgust uh, because he won't quit now. He's rooting after 9-11, not 9-11, January 6th. He's Rudy after Giuliani. After he's Rudy, he's Rudy after January 6th, leaving that message on Tommy Tuberville's phone. See, he thinks he's Kevin McCarthy. McCarthy went 15 rounds back in January, but with each round, people caved, and his count went up. Jordan's count is heading down and it's about to go down precipitously. The only reason he got 200 and then 199 is because the party is desperate to make anyone the speaker, even Jim Jordan, who nobody likes. No matter what the whip count says, as of this morning, Jim Jordan vows to fight on with this third round, this kamikaze mission. And that begs the question, does a sadist, he is a sadist, does a sadist like J Jim Jordan also derive a perverse satisfaction by getting shackled to the rack? And the answer is yes. This is Jim Jordan showing up uh, in his gimp suit. Yes, that is Jim Jordan. Because from what I've read and what I've been told, bullies also like to be bullied. They like the humiliation. Jordan thinks, however, he doesn't enjoy it, but he, he secretly craves it. He's walking towards it because he knows, deep down inside, he deserves it. He knows he looked the other way at Ohio State University. He knows 
He deserves to be punished. This third round, if it happens, is a suicide mission, like the round before that and the round before that, and the round, round four, round five. Uh, when it stops, nobody knows. Uh, if you haven't filled out the poll in the chat room, it's my first ever poll, and I will try to check it at the end of the show. Do you think Jim Jordan will ever quit? I don't think he will. Uh, I think they're going to have to put him in a straitjacket and uh, send him to the funny farm. Uh, he knows he's going to lose. He knows he can't afford more than three defectors. But nevertheless, he persisted. May I have some more, mistress? How many times do you think Jim Jordan has shelled out money and said, may I have some more, mistress? On Wednesday, uh, on Wednesday's round, uh, he had 22 defectors. That was two more defectors than he had on round one, which was Tuesday. Please, mistress, may I have some more? Paul Kane from the Washington Post says Jordan's 199 votes set a modern record for worst showing by a majority party's nominee for speaker. You should send Jim Jordan a postcard and let him know that. He set a record for worst showing by a party, a major party's nominee for speaker. 199 votes, lowest that a major party's candidate ever got for speaker. Send him a postcard. Let him know. It may make him too messant. Jordan is a failure. He's a failure. And he knows that. He, he's never passed a single piece of legislation. All his investigations into Joe Biden and Hunter Biden come up as short as Jim Jordan standing naked in a uh, locker room. He's a loser. He's a loser. And his way of doing business turns people off. Nobody likes a small-time hood, which is what Jim Jordan is. He's just a, a, a small-time hood. Sean Hannity, Steve Bannon, and Jordan's congressional surrogates have been working the phones late into the early morning, and that only seems to embolden the holdouts, the defectors. You see, with Jim Jordan, the small-town hoodlum doesn't understand is Congress, as bad as it is, isn't a wrestling team. It's not the sports department over at Ohio State University where people give in, look the other way because your elbows are sharper and who needs the aggravation. This is Congress and nobody is impressed by Jim Jordan. Right now, Jim Jordan's defeat is being seen as a total repudiation of his slash and burn technique, which has never worked. It's never worked on anyone other than Kevin McCarthy when Jordan fished for choice committee assignments. Kevin McCarthy used Jim Jordan to be the pit bull, the attack dog which is unfair to pit bulls. I've gotten some complaints, and I apologize, because pit bulls are lovely dogs. My niece has one. They're absolutely beautiful and adorable. So I apologize. Jordan created a lot of ill will by the way he treated Steve Scalise. He didn't even give Scalise a day to build a coalition for a floor vote. If you remember, I went over this yesterday, Last Wednesday, Jordan went up against Steve Scalise, and he lost to Steve Scalise, 
And Jordan walked up to Scalise and he says, you get one round. He pointed in Steve Scalise's chest. He says, you get one round, you drop out and then you nominate me. That's what he, he threatened Steve Scalise. And then he stormed out in front of everybody, screaming, America wants me. Delusional. This is, you know, this is a sick, sick man. And, you know, I know the Republicans are very sick, but some of them have to look at Jim. They have to smell. You know how bad Jim Jordan smells? It's like sulfuric bile. And you have to believe that a lot of these Republicans have some self-awareness and they see Jim Jordan and wonder, am I like that? Is that who I am? I ever like that? Texas Republican Kay Granger is the appropriations chair. And once again, she voted no on Jim Jordan two times in a row. She explained she's voting her conscience. And she warned that despite the intimidation and threats that were coming her way, the threats to her staff, it only hardened her opposition to Jim Jordan. I talked about this yesterday, their strong arm, brown shirt tactics. Uh, he was delusional. He thought, I can get what I want with my sharp elbows. Steve Womack of Arkansas voted for Scalise instead of Jordan, even though Scalise wasn't running. Once again, he accused Jim Jordan of kneecapping Scalise, calling it the most egregious act against a fellow House member he ever witnessed. Womack, after voting for Scalise on Tuesday, said he was targeted by Steve Bannon, who on Bannon's podcast, The War Room, gave out his phone number, doxed him to unleash the Furies. And if you've ever been attacked by this right-wing MAGA machine, it can be terrifying. Womack is infuriated and publicly warned, you want to go a third round, Jim Jordan? I guarantee you, you're, you go a third round, it'll be a free fall. A free, he warned it's going to be a free fall. It will be the final straw of your career. Congressman Don Bacon of Nebraska warned that a vote for Jordan is rewarding bad behavior. And he said on Wednesday that Jordan is all done. All done. And if he wants to save what's left of his tattered reputation, he will not subject the rest of the caucus and the House of Representatives to a third round. Bacon said a third round will only make things much worse for Jim Jordan. When will Jim Jordan surrender? Who knows? He's an election denier. Maybe never. Donald Trump never surrendered. Uh, and Jim Jordan, who was instrumental in January 6, he will not admit that Donald Trump lost. So is Jim Jordan capable of accepting election results that don't turn out the way he wanted? He manufactured election fraud for Trump. This defeat, Tuesday's defeat, Wednesday's defeat, today's defeat, is going to be tough for him because it's black and white and you can't claim fraud. You know, you, you can we know who's in the room and you, you can keep counting the ballots, Jim. There aren't a, a mother and daughter in Fulton County who you can intimidate and, and try to convince everyone that they're stuffing ballots for Steve Scalise. It's pretty easy to count these votes. It's undeniable. You lost. It's tough for an election denier not to be able to lie and say he actually won. So what to do? What to do? Like Trump, like Rudy, like the whole stinking lot of them, 
All he knows how to do is to keep going. Turn it into a, a suicide mission. Every instinct, every, every protein in his DNA is telling Jim Jordan to soldier on even when the people closest to him now believe a third round would bring an additional 15 defectors. So we'd be looking at 35 defectors and then a fourth round, the bottom falls out. Noticeably absent, this is what I find really interesting, delightful and delicious and satisfying because I was scared. You notice I have a spring to my step because if you watch the show, I was terrified that he was going to be our speaker. Noticeably absent from Jordan's campaign for speaker was Jordan's calling card, Joe Biden's impeachment. That is Jim Jordan's calling card. Stolen election. No mention of the stolen election. He's spent the past two years insisting that Hunter Biden is worse than Osama bin Laden. He's been telling us that the FBI and the Justice Department have been weaponized and must be defunded. Those are his issues. That's what he stands for. That is his calling card. The election was stolen by Twitter. But when he campaigns for votes among his own caucus members, he mentions none of that because nobody wants to hear it. It's not a winning message inside the caucus or out. His fellow Republicans read the polls and they know impeaching Biden, going after Hunter, is cruel and unfair. But without that, who is Jim Jordan? Without cruelty, without being mean and unfair, who is Jim Jordan? He's nothing. He stands for nothing. He offers nothing other than fear, retribution, and his baseball bat. He is the neighborhood bully, and everyone in the Republican Party is waiting for somebody else to knock him out. Nobody, and I mean nobody, wanted to deliver Jim Jordan's nominating speech on Wednesday. Nobody. Not Kevin McCarthy, not Steve Scalise, not Elise Stefanik. She did it the first time. She said, I'm not doing it again. Not Elise, not Scalise. It fell on Chairman of the Rules Committee, Tom Cole, to take one for the team and deliver a meandering endorsement that pretty much said, whatever. It was really bad. It was, it was ironic. It was like it, there were two levels to his speech. Uh, he was basically throwing Jim Jordan under the bus. Uh, Tom Cole comes from a, a pretty secure seat. I don't, think he give a sh I don't think he gave a shit what he said. I think his speech was designed to remind people of just exactly who Jim Jordan was. He, uh, it was like damning with faint praise it was, you know, Mark Anthony. He, he praised Jordan for his commitment to spending cuts. And then he said, we all know, and especially Jim knows, that the biggest drivers of debt are Medicare, Social Security, and Medicaid. And Jim Jordan, as our speaker, will have the courage to start cutting those three. I mean, he was saying, uh, <laughs> you really want this guy for speaker? You want him? He'll cut Medicare, Social Security, and Medicaid. You think you're going to get reelected with him as speaker? There's a reason Kay Granger, the chair of the House Appropriations Committee, got 
six other members of the Appropriations Committee not to vote for Jim Jordan on the first round. They are terrified that he is speaker. His draconian cuts will destroy this country. So when Tom Cole (laughs) nominated him by saying, come on, we got to elect him as speaker. He's going to He's going to cut Medicare, Social Security, and Medicaid. Everybody was thinking, I don't want to do this. I, I, I still want to. I, I, I want my job. Uh, it's pretty. You should watch uh, Tom Cole's nominating speech. And then Tom Cole did the greatest hits and began to lie. He blamed the fentanyl crisis on migrants smuggling it over the border. That is a lie. That is a lie. We've been over that. That is another lie. Uh, The Cato Institute, a right-wing think tank, or as I call it, a think stank. The Cato Institute says fentanyl has nothing to do with migrants. Instead, it's brought in by American citizens at legal border crossings. There's absolutely no evidence linking the fentanyl crisis to these migrants, these women and children and men who are fleeing and should be welcomed into our country, who are a gift. They are a gift to this country and should be treated as such. Well, where do we go from here other than hell? Self-styled, reasonable. I'm in a good mood uh, because Jim Jordan is being humiliated, and I like that. That makes me happy. I I really, like, this is a good day. We have our good days and our bad days, and I like to see bad people humiliated. I like to see bullies suffer. Uh, I believe in law and order, and I believe in justice. And if Jim Jordan is miserable and, and feels broken and sad, then it's a good day for David Feldman. I'm giddy. It's a good day for America if Jim Jordan is feeling broken and sad. So where do we go from here? uh, Self-styled, reasonable Republicans, the problem solvers like David Joyce of Ohio, they're pushing Speaker pro tem Patrick McHenry as a 30-day leader. Former GOP speakers Newt Gingrich and John Boehner on Tuesday endorsed elevating McHenry to speaker pro tem. That seems to be what reasonable Republicans are pitching. And it seems reasonable on the surface, but don't be fooled. Uh, it, It works out perfectly if you want to rush a foreign aid bill to Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan and avert a government shutdown after November 17th. That, it does work out that way. The problem, and this is why it's never going to happen, we're never going to have a speaker. We are never going to have a speaker. Uh, the Republicans can't come together because they don't stand for anything. It's just petty grievances and ego and lashing out and the breach cannot be repaired. I really think we're looking at a no speaker by November 7th. I hope I'm wrong, and I usually am, although not always. Uh, I think by November 17th, we we don't have a speaker because I think that's the plan. I think the Freedom Caucus, their plan is no speaker, No extension of the continuing resolution, no budget, no government, no spending. Success. I mean, that's success. This is what they want. I think they're going through the motions of pretending, oh, we can't come together. But there are about 20, 25 MAGA, far-right Republicans who think this is fantastic. This is what they want. I don't think we're going to have a speaker until, like, 2025. Uh, The problem with uh, McHenry uh, 
is nobody will go for it because there is no question making McHenry speaker is a McCarthy Mick restoration. McHenry is McCarthy's guy. And the whole point of vacating the chair was to reject everything McCarthy stood for. McCarthy's still in the speaker's office. McHenry isn't even in there. He said, oh, no, boss, it's yours. Jordan says, yes, let's do a vote on making McHenry a uh, speaker because he wants to smoke out the treasonous Republicans. That's he, he has said publicly, yes, let's vote on whether or not to make McHenry a 30 day speaker because Jim Jordan wants to smoke out the treasonous Republicans who would work with the Democrats because this is a bipartisan idea. So he wants to smoke out the enemy. Well, up in the Senate, things are a little better. You have moderate Republicans who want to do some work, and they want McHenry to become speaker. People like Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, a horrible guy, but he is an institutionalist, and he signaled on Wednesday that unlike House Republicans, Senate Republicans want this government to function. Uh, he works with Schumer. Uh, if you remember, he worked with Schumer crafting a bipartisan continuing resolution that served as the template for the one McCarthy ended up passing on the House floor. I don't know if you remember that. It's a lot of stuff that's been going on in the past 10 years. It's hard to keep track of all this. Uh, McConnell has signaled he's on the same page as Biden and Chuck Schumer when it comes to getting a supplemental aid package for Ukraine done, despite some misgivings in his own caucus, like Ron Paul. Ron Paul doesn't even want to give aid to Israel. Uh, there is a uh, Resistance to helping Ukraine, but it hasn't gained the kind of traction among Senate Republicans the way it has in the House. I mean, you have some members of the House openly <laughs> rooting for Putin. In the Senate, you hear more tempered complaints. You'll hear Republicans calling for an inspector general to keep an eye on where these, Ukraine, these uh, weapons we sent to Ukraine, where, where they end up, we don't have an inspector general monitoring the weapons. Uh, you have some Republicans who are saying, you know, I want to give, the Senate Republicans will, will say, you know, I want to give Ukraine money, but I don't want to give them a blank check. Uh, but right now you have enough Senate Republicans who want to send money to Ukraine. Since Russia invaded, Congress has already approved $113 billion in military and humanitarian aid for Ukraine. And while that seems like a lot, it is a smaller percentage of our gross domestic product than any of the major European countries. Germany, France, Great Britain are giving much larger percentages of their GDP. If you recall, and who does, I can't remember any of this, so I'm going to remind myself, and you can listen if you want to. In August, Joe Biden asked Congress to approve a $24 billion military aid supplemental. Now, supplemental means you have your budget for 2023, and then you go, ooh, we need to give, we need more money that's not budgeted, that's a supplemental. So Biden, no fool he, he's a creature of the Senate, he thought, all right, we'll get a $24 billion military aid supplemental uh, tacked onto the 2023 budget, which is over October 1st, and then we either get more money for Ukraine in the October 1st, 2024 budget, or we get, or we work on another supplemental. Uh, Zelensky visited 
if you remember, and he picked up a lot of resistance from House Republicans. Like McCarthy met privately with Zelensky. He couldn't, the caucus was not interested, the Republican caucus was not interested in talking to Zelensky. That's in the House. In, in the Senate, the Republicans met with Zelensky. While he was Speaker, Kevin McCarthy and Biden made a side deal to keep the government open. They passed that continuing resolution. McCarthy agreed to pass a continuing resolution without any aid for Ukraine because he knew that the hard right in his caucus would never approve a continuing resolution that included funding for Ukraine. McCarthy's deal with Biden, it was a secret deal, sort of. It was to keep the government open pass the continuing resolution, and then we get to work on a 2024 budget. And then after we pass the budget, and to McCarthy's credit, before he was vacated or defenestrated, he had passed about four or five appropriations bills that made up about 70% of the budget. So he was getting the budget done. I still can't stand them. Uh, But the deal was we passed the continuing resolution, which they did. Then we get going on a 2024 budget. And then after we pass the budget, we cobble together a supplemental that pairs funding for Ukraine with an equal amount of funding for border security. And that, and only that, is why people think McCarthy is a moderate. Uh, And that side deal is probably what sank McCarthy's speakership with people like Matt Gaetz. The hard right wants nothing to do with Ukraine. They want transparency. They weren't told about this side deal that McCarthy made with Schumer and Biden and McConnell. They, they all made this deal. Uh, the hard right in the House felt they were being railroaded into keeping the government open, and they feared that they would be railroaded again into a Ukraine supplemental because these supplementals uh, get a lot of momentum and end up being immune from normal budgetary process. So they did what nobody thought they would do, They fired Kevin McCarthy. And like I said, the hard right began to take its revenge by doing what they wanted to do all along, and that is essentially shut down the government without actually shutting down the government. That's what they've done. We don't have a speaker. You know, you lied to us. You made a side deal. Well, we're shutting down the government without shutting down the government. You, we have no House of Representatives. We have shut down the House of Representatives. And while this might seem like chaos to the rest of the world, for the Freedom Caucus, for somebody like Chip Roy, this is sound fiscal policy. No speaker means no funding bills gets sent to Joe Biden's desk. That's precisely what the hard right wants. It's what they were sent to Washington to do. Not just to do away with runaway spending, to do away with the government. This is what they want. We may never have a speaker. There are people who consider you what we what normal, sentient, loving, gentle people see as chaos. Chip Roy sees as success. This is exactly <clears throat> what what they what they want. It is becoming increasingly obvious that the hard right in the House wants to play out the clock by putting up a series of failed candidates for speaker until November 17th rolls around and the continuing resolution expires and the government has to shut down because Joe Biden and Chuck Schumer can't negotiate 
with a speakerless House, which is why I think Jim Jordan is going to go 100 and 200 rounds. He's a masochist and a sadist. He, he wants to be debased. And he's giving everybody a show, serving the hard right by tying up, gumming up the works. What, I mean, what could be better for the Trump wing of the party? A nightly show. Will, you know, how many fewer votes will Jim Jordan get? And it just keeps going on and on, and there's no government. And no, I mean, that's what they want. And you get a show out of it. And you get to see Jim Jordan. It's like wrestling. He'll pretend to be uh, humiliated. Meanwhile, Biden, Schumer, and McConnell are behaving like there's going to be a fully functioning legislative branch in just a matter of days. <laughs> there's a good chance. I, I can't stress this enough. MAGA Republicans have figured out that you don't need to shut down the entire government. You just need to shut down the House of Representatives. That's how you get everything you want if, it, if everything you want is nothing. Biden, Schumer, and McConnell are reportedly cobbling together a foreign aid package that could be as much as $100 billion split evenly between Israel and Ukraine. Now, Israel is an easy sell for the Freedom Caucus because they hate Arabs more than they hate Jews. So the Freedom Caucus is all in on Israel. Ukraine, not so much. And McConnell is now hinting that he and Schumer have agreed to create kind of like a, an omnibus spending bill for foreign aid. Uh, they, they would turn the $100 billion package into a bill that not only funds Israel, but also Ukraine, Taiwan, and then border security. Like they get, they get some of the Freedom Caucus on board because it's border security. Israel, as I see it, would be the glue that keeps this supplemental together. M McConnell knows that the hard right is afraid of getting blamed for voting against aid to Israel. So you wrap this into, you call it a... a, a a pa an aid package to Israel. And then you toss in Ukraine and Taiwan without any opportunity to sever Israel from this aid package. So the hard right ends up with its back against the wall. You, you don't get a separate bill. You get this entire $100, $100 billion bill. You have to vote for it because it's Israel, but we've also included Ukraine Taiwan, and your border security. But we won't let you vote separately uh, on Israel, Ukraine. And this is what Matt Gates was complaining about. They, they, they and he's right, they, they force these packages together. It, it's like your cable company. I, I don't want to pay for Fox News or the Golf Channel, well, you have no choice. Then, then, then you don't get C-SPAN. But I don't want to give money to the Golf Channel or Fox. That's that's we're bundling this cable package. If you want C-SPAN, you also have to support Rupert Murdoch, and that's how they pass legislation. And Matt Gates wants to put an end to it. Um, so that's what they would do. Call it, they know everybody's afraid not to fund Israel, so they'll call it the, you know, we're afraid of looking weak, Bill. We love you, Israel. And uh, the secondary, you know, Ukraine, Taiwan will be secondary afterthoughts. Oh, is there also funding for Ukraine and Taiwan? I, I didn't see that. 
I didn't, I didn't notice that. All right, I'm going to wrap it up. I'm in a good mood. I'm very happy. I mean, the world is falling apart. But Jim Jordan's in pain tonight. Jim Jordan's in pain. Unfortunately, he probably likes to be in pain. Day 13, the Israel-Gaza war. I'll wrap it up. Senate Intelligence Committee Chair Mark Warner, he's the Democrat, and the ranking Republican on that committee is Marco Rubio. That means, I don't mean to be pedantic, uh, most of you already know this, but if when they say ranking Republican, it means you have a, a chair of the committee from the, the majority party, and then you have a ranking chair who from the Republican Party in the Senate. Uh, and so the ranking chair would be the rank Marco Rubio. And both Mark Warner and Marco Rubio from the Senate Intelligence Committee said they reviewed American intelligence and they have concluded that the strike on the Gaza hospital that killed hundreds was caused by a stray Hamas rocket that had been intended for Israel and it misfired. So when I talked to friends, um, it's okay if it was a Hamas rocket. Uh, Yes, you know, uh, and no, none of this is okay. None of this is okay because the Israelis are being led by a thug, Benjamin Netanyahu, who through stochastic terrorism helped, helped, create an atmosphere that led to the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin, who signed the Oslo Accords in 93, peace with the Palestinians, two-state solution that would have been fraught with violence and terrorism. But better than this, much better than this, this is what... Benjamin Netanyahu hath wrought. And the Israelis don't like him. The Israelis don't like him. All right. Uh, during his meeting with Israeli Prime Minister uh, Bibi Netanyahu, President Biden said... I just, I know this is a tragedy. This is depressing. A lot of people, uh, some people, like I think I'm immune to what's really going on in the world, but you know, COVID makes us sad and depressed and the news makes you sad and depressed. So um, I have a perverse Things just strike me. Uh, nothing's funny about this, but this is what Joe Biden said to Bibi Netanyahu about the, uh, the attack. Based on what I've seen, it appears as though it was done by the other team, not you. The other team. Is there an app where we can bet on this? The other team? Good. I, I, look, I, I'm beginning, I don't live in my car. Uh, I'm not about to be evicted. Uh, so I'm a little forgiving of Joe Biden. I wanted Bernie. But I'm scared and sad and weak and vulnerable. And I am starting to fall prey to Joe Biden as a uh, sweet and gentle alternative to Donald Trump. 
I know I'm wrong. I know I'm wrong. When we're scared, as Joe Biden said to Israel, don't make the same mistakes we made after 9-11. We turn, you know, we 90% approval rating for that, that monkey George W. Bush. Uh, and that's a disservice to monkeys. All right. That's your big quote here. I mean, from a historical perspective, I know Joe Biden is deeply flawed. But he warned Israel, don't make the same mistakes America did after 9-11. What a profound statement to come out of the mouth of our commander in chief. And he brought the troops home from Afghanistan. He brought the troops home from Afghanistan. So, can't even talk about it. That it's like a, it's not uh, a winning message. But if you're a baby boomer who remembers the Vietnam War, was there ever a president who, who said I was going to I'm going to bring the troops home, and he actually brought the troops home within what nine months of his presidency? So. I'm David Feldman reminding you to stay strong and protect the weak. It's a good day. It's a good day. Some days are better than others. Some, some days are bad. Some days are sad. But when grinders like Jim Jordan, who think, I just don't quit. I'm like Donald Trump. I just don't quit. I'll win because I want it more than everybody else does, when they are told, no, no, you hit a wall, you're not getting anywhere. Uh, and they have to confront their, their ina inadequacies for the first time in their life and have to look in the mirror and discover how rancid they are as human beings and they stink and that's why people don't want you to be the speaker when they have to confront that. It's a good day. Unfortunately, they are resilient and they bounce back. But today, Jim Jordan is broken. And that's a good thing. Please like the show. Please subscribe to the channel. Please go to my website and uh, subscribe to uh, my newsletter. Thank you to the, the mod. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. The poll. The poll. All right, I don't know how to do this. Let's see if I can do this. Hang on, we did a poll. Okay, I may get this wrong. Please okay. subscribe to the channel. Ooh, Please go that. Uh, wow. Um, okay. Now we should do a we should do card sharks, where we we asked. That's uh, 1,396 votes. Wow. Thank you, everybody. Mind-boggling. Now it's up to 1,400 votes. Okay. I've never done this before. The Will Jim Jordan Ever Quit? 45% said, yes, he will quit. 55% said, no, he won't quit. Uh, that's our poll. Now, can I do more polls? Can I, how many polls can I keep going here? 1,407 people, 410 voted. 411, wow. Now, can you see the results? It's rigged. <laughs> Can oh hold it you it let you vote more than once, really? Hmm. And we do have thank you Bob Carmody by the way. 
Okay. Uh, interestingly enough, only 40% of my audience voted, just like uh, in America. So, okay. All right, I'm going to wrap it up. Thank you. This is fun. I probably want to do this instead of, <laughs> instead of the regular show. Just, just read the chat. 14, 1,440 votes now. 1,441. Now it's, but now it's gone down. Now it's gone up to 1,442. How does this work? Goodbye. Um, I'll see every... Okay, so we start at 105 today, which is much better. Uh, I'm, get, I'm getting better. I'm going to try to get it back to 1205. Thank you all. Uh, the poll was really interesting. Thank you. I think that covers everything. Thank you, thank you, thank you.